Well, folks, after years of waiting, it's finally happened. We will be virtually touring the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Though it's associated with the most famous zoo in the world, the Safari Park has made a name for itself with its collection of rarities, never-ending savannas, innovative ways to save endangered species, and so much more that I'll cover in this video. You'll be getting a full breakdown of everything I know about the park, just based on two visits. It's my job to give you an idea of what to expect, how flexible you may or may not have to be with your cash, and go through each exhibit area and point out the absolute can't misses. Since I don't come here as often, if you are a local, please do not be afraid to comment on everything that I may not cover in this video. Formerly known as the San Diego Wild Animal Park, opened in 1972. Today, it's a sanctuary to over 3,500 animals from 400 species. But one thing that should grab everyone's attention is that it's all enclosed in over 1,800 acres. Now, how do you get here? The Safari Park is located in Escondido, which is about a half an hour drive from downtown San Diego. I've seen quite a few people online wonder if there's any transportation that's owned by the zoo and the Safari Park to get you from one park to the other. Not only is that not a thing, but the two are 30 miles apart. This does seem like a good time to answer the question, which one should I visit if I only have time for one park? And I will get to that at the end of the review. As of summer 2020, parking rates go for $20 per vehicle and RV and preferred parking is $38 and up. A single day pass is $64 for ages 3 to 11 and $74 for 12 and up. Two day passes, which gets you into either the zoo or safari park or both is $116 for a child and $126 for adults. Three for one gets you into the zoo, safari park, and SeaWorld for $155 for children and $165 for adults, which is an absolute steal. Right at the gate is the Wings of the World walkthrough aviary, which was sadly closed on my last visit. But lucky for bird enthusiasts like me, there's plenty more feathers spread throughout the park. Technically, the trail will bring you into the Nairobi village. To avoid backtracking, I prefer to ignore it and head left. About a third of the mile away from the entrance is one of San Diego's newest exhibits. When Walkabout Australia opened, it became the standard for Australian attractions in the US. It's large hilly, very thematic, and just tries to be as different as possible with its displays and the animals themselves. The walkthrough portion is one of the largest I've ever seen. The rest area is supposed to be an old sheep wool shed. The restrooms are so rustic they look like they were built over a century ago. And the tree kangaroos and cassowaries already make this area all the more interesting. But the must see is the platypus, the only ones in the nation. As you might expect, they are extremely popular, and I've been in a situation where the crowd was so big, each party was only allowed to view them for 30 seconds. This happened to me on a random November Sunday, but for some reason, not on Mother's Day. So all I can say is get here about a half an hour after the park opens because these interesting animals are not always out when the gate opens. Since this will be the next tour, I will not spoil too much further, but I will say that Walkabout Australia is pretty much a perfect exhibit and a really perfect way to kick off your zoo day. Continue on and you'll find yourself, if not one of, then the highest accessible point in the entire park. Condor Ridge takes advantage of the natural San Diego landscape to make for one very dry, immersive, and breathtaking experience. The World Gardens hillside sits right above it and is home to hundreds of funky looking plant species. And of course that steep incline makes for a great workout. The focus of the wildlife is either local or ranges just outside of California, including bighorn sheep, the famous California condor, and a few smaller surprises. Some that are rescues and some that are very talkative. If you take your little ones to zoos to get inspired by conservation work, from what I saw, Condor Ridge has more educational value than anywhere else in the safari park. Since this was built on a steep incline, the exhibit doubles as an observation deck to the most beautiful views not just in the park, but arguably in any zoo in America. And if you have a good zoom camera, there's a lot more out there than what meets the eye. The must sees at the moment, in my opinion, are the desert bighorn sheep. They're a threatened subspecies. Not too many zoos have bighorn sheep in the first place. And every so often there will be multiple lambs at a time pitter-pattering on the cliffs. 
Like how Walkabout Australia became a standard for Australian exhibits, at the time the Tiger Trail became the standard for Southeast Asian Tiger exhibits. And who doesn't love tigers? Getting this close to them can leave an impact that could last forever. And this attraction gives you the opportunity to do it three different times. Even if you don't have cooperating cats, there's still quite a bit to admire. It's immersive, there's varied landscape, a playground, it's educational, and very culturally centered, especially with the long house, a concession stop, a gift shop, and a viewing shelter all in one. And on the plus side, it's decorated around Christmas time. Obviously, the must-sees are the tigers, but they're so elusive they can be easy to miss, even with three exhibits. I got lucky and saw activity in all three of them around 10 a.m. Going back downhill, the Nairobi Village is essentially the zoo's central plaza, so it's full of food, markets, and also quite a few animals. The exhibit has an African name, but the species list is positively all over the place. There's a line of reptiles, a sand cat, a lot of little itty bitty hooves, and also a lot of birds. Some that I think are free to roam the guest path, and some that call this lagoon home. Now if only the shoebill stork was still back there. If I had to tell someone what to look out for, I'd say the storm stork, a very rare species, what could be a walkthrough bat exhibit if the bats wanted it to be, and an open nursery where some of the zoo's newest newborns are raised. If you're a local, you might laugh, but I always struggle to get to the gorilla forest. Even though the map's directions are pretty clear, it's a little out of the way. You can't just not see gorillas. Some zoo enthusiasts think that this is not quite up to San Diego standards especially when you compare it to the zoo's more immersive gorilla habitat. But it's still a great size, the apes have a lot to do, and they are always out in the open. Nothing against the apes, but I come here for the birds. There's bee eaters and two walkthrough aviaries. If gorillas are not the must see, then I would like to point you in the direction of the Journey into the Wild Show, a 20 minute presentation that introduces you to the park's animal ambassadors, all while you learn about the San Diego Wildlife Alliance's conservation work. After the Gibbon Enclosure, which used to be a walkthrough lemur exhibit by the way, this is where the path might get a little tricky for anyone that's not familiar with this place. When I got to this point, I was like, what now? First of all, go as far as you can to the edge of the deck if you want another amazing view. But this one comes with the iconic giant hot air balloon. But pretty much no matter where you are, you can always see this when it's in the air. This is a separate paid experience that takes you into the sky and lets you see nearly every square inch of the grounds for about 10 to 12 minutes. I couldn't find a recent source mentioning how much it is, but past sources say that it might be $20 per person. From that viewing deck, you go down using either the elevator or the steps into the African woods. Now this is where the safari park starts to show off its two specialties, large hoofstock and large birds. Some that are either endangered, rare in zoos, or both. It's a very low key, quick to go through area that starts a slope into what I call the lower half of the zoo. You don't wanna miss out on the Egyptian vulture and hopefully you'll catch the Garanuk doing what they do best, which is eating while standing on their hind legs and you'll eventually slope towards the African outpost. It's a little more bird centric, but overall the design is far more flashier. There used to be way more interesting species down here. Now I only really think of the outpost as a way to get away from the main crowd and enjoy the beautiful glimmering sights of the lagoon. That and the marabou storks. And if you're lucky, the dick dicks and the cheetahs might show as well. I didn't see the cats, but one of the wedding packages does place your ceremony right in front of the speedy cats. And the whole time you'd also be looking at the African Plains, a compilation of some of the largest individual habitats in any zoo. If you go online and measure all of the main fields, you'll get about 150 acres of combined land, although I know there's definitely more. Coincidentally, the African Plains marked the third time this year I've talked about an African exhibit that cannot be viewed in its entirety from the regular footpaths. The Watering Hole Cafe and and the main overlook lets you see a good chunk of it, but only from a distance. So to see the rest of it, you have to go on safari. Get in line for the Africa tram. The line wait times are posted, but when it said 40 minutes, my wait was actually only 20. 
For 25 minutes, your guide will stroll you around these incredible enclosures that mimic the wild in so many ways. My favorite part was when we stopped by the Southern White Rhinos and learned how these individuals will be involved in saving the functionally extinct Northern White Rhino. If you still believe this is not a close enough experience for you, there are plenty of more add-ons that I will get to in a bit. Past the Africa Tramp Station is the highly praised Lion Camp, often called the best lion habitat in the US because of its size, close encounters, and the way that it blends with the African plains in the background, giving off that vibe that, yep, this all definitely belongs to the lions. It's really cool to look at, but obviously you want to see the lions move around, and that's something that they are not famous for. But I did see Bo here on the prowl around 2.30 p.m. Right behind Lion Camp is what's still called the Cheetah Safari, a running strip for cheetah demonstrations, but I was told they don't run for the general public anymore. Instead, we were still treated to a serval cat. However, running demonstrations are now reserved for those that sign up for the Sunup Cheetah Safari. You get a private cheetah show, brunch at the watering hole, and an African safari, but I could no longer find such a way to sign up for this online for some reason. Now, as of 2024, the Elephant Valley is, or depending on when you watch this, was under construction for a massive expansion. Some of the aesthetics were a little outdated, but even the older enclosures are still some of the largest I've ever seen. As I'm saying this, the Safari Park is improving their elephants' lives even more by doubling their living space, which is set to open in 2025. However, the construction does not stop you from seeing the herd. The last major thing that I want to talk about is to go over their add-on safaris, and there are a lot of them. And choosing the right one is very important because I imagine most travelers are on a time crunch. Located between the Lion Camp and Elephant Valley is the campground for the Roar and Snore Safari, an overnight experience that includes camping activities, after hours looks at the wildlife, dinner, and more. And depending on which one you choose, you'll always have this view from your campground. The other big one is the Flight Line Safari, a zip lining tour that will securely soar you as high as 130 feet off the ground, right above some of the savannas. But perhaps the most popular add-ons are the cart and wildlife safaris. The wildlife safari will take you into the savannas for unforgettable close-up views of Africa's favorites. Depending on which one you choose, or better yet, what you feel like spending depends on the length, location, and experience of your tour. A cheaper option can be found on the list of cart safaris. It's like the Africa tram, but way longer, and since you have a guide, it will feel more personal. I chose Cart Safari Asia to get a more exclusive look at the Asian savanna, something that can only just barely be seen from the Condor Ridge. I know that hoofed animals aren't everyone's favorites, but that's another reason why I chose this. The park's rarest and most endangered animals can be found in this canyon, and that includes Included a baby Indian rhino, a cloned wild horse, and a few more that I will get to on my actual tours. Now, what I'm about to say is not guaranteed, but since I signed up for the last Cart Safari Asia time slot, and because it's not that popular of an experience, I was the only one that signed up and was given a longer tour, and even got to see a few things that are not usually included in this safari. Oh, by the way, if you plan on signing up for one of these safaris, you need to meet with your group right here next to the cheetahs. So with the tour out of the way, now it's time to briefly give my overall thoughts. Some of you might be wondering why I said what I said in that video in the corner, and here's why. When I came here near the end of 2022, I did not have the best time. The platypus time thing was a bit of a put off. I'm not kidding when I say that nearly half of the animals were off exhibit. I got lost so many times, and because the elephant to tiger path that completed this circle was closed off, off, there was several miles worth of backtracking. However, in 2024, all of those seem to have resolved themselves and I had one of the best zoo visits of my life. I stayed here from open to close, saw everything at least twice, and obviously had time for an add-on experience 
and the Africa Tram. To finally answer the question, let's say that you're in San Diego and you only have time for either the zoo or the safari park. Which one should you go with? Just in general, I recommend the safari park to anyone, but I can't say that it was designed for everyone. It's not like having a casual stroll through a zoo. There's a lot of walking up and down these hills nearly everywhere, and even I was feeling it afterwards for several days. So if you're traveling solo or go with a partner, I might recommend the safari park, but if you do have like a family of four for your sanity and your feet, I would go with the zoo. And that will conclude this walk around of the world famous San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Comment below if watching this inspired you to make a visit. If you are a regular, again, please let me know what I may have missed. And more importantly, stay tuned for the next episode. And thank you all for watching Zoo Tours.